So today we are going to begin uh, something just a little different, something new. We're going to be going to a different place. So grab your Bibles and um, go with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke uh, and Luke chapter 4. I want to um, read a passage of scripture there. We're going to pray and then we're going to talk and allow God to be God in our midst. Amen. Are you all doing all right this morning? Amen. Everybody doing okay? Good. You're ready to hear from, from God as it relates to what God may have for us this morning? Amen. Amen. Good. Let's look forward to receiving a word from the Lord. Luke chapter 4 and jump down to verses 18. I just want to read, read two passages of scripture and then we're going to talk um, and all I'm doing today is I'm just going to be laying some foundation for what we're going to be talking about probably for a while, you know, and a while meaning that I think God is just really shaping and molding me as it relates to what this ministry ought to be about and who we ought to be about. So open your hearts to hear and receive from God. Luke chapter 4 verses, um, let me read 18 and 19, then we're going to pray. And Luke writes, Jesus saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let me read that one more time. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Bow your heads with me in a word of prayer as we pray and then we're going to go to God's word this morning that God would move and have his way. Father, we thank you for you. We open our hearts to hear, our hearts to be in tune Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. We listen. Um, speak afresh to us, God. Fill us afresh with your spirit. Speak to us as a community of believers, God, so we can have world impact. We can have community impact. We can have state impact, Lord. So speak through me as Felix moves himself out of the way, as I say every Sunday. If you don't speak, there is nothing to say. So we want to hear from you plainly this morning. So Holy Spirit, have your way. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Now repeat after me and then we're going to go into our message. Say, my identity is in Christ. And I'm a child of the King. Yeah, one more time. Say, my identity is in Christ. And I am a child of the King. Amen. As we kind of look at the word on this morning, I want to begin here. Um, for those of us who consider ourselves followers of Christ, now that we uh, know what our true identity is, now that we know who we are, and now that we know who God has called us to be, I think we have an obligation and we have something now that God expects from us as he's left us in the world because there's, there's implications that's now attached to the fact that I'm a child of the king. That means something, all right? And I want to talk through that, and I want us to get a good feel of what that means and what that's all about. So, in other words, in many ways, as believers in Christ, we are now citizens of a different kingdom. Come on, say amen. I want to walk this out with you, and I want you all to hear carefully what I'm saying. We, we're no longer residents of, and I'm going to use the term, secular world that we find ourselves in, we are kingdom subjects and we're citizens of a different world. The, world, the word I used um, a couple of Fridays ago is that we're resident aliens. We live here, but we don't live here. <laughs> Come on, does that make sense? Very, very important. My home is in heaven, but I have a job to do while I'm here. So I am a follower of another ruler. I want to walk through that real carefully because as, as at salvation... I was transferred to a world system that is under the reign of a sovereign God. Come on. 
So, so this may trouble you, but I want to make this statement very carefully because we're going to flesh this out. So that means as a kingdom citizen, I am neither Republican nor Democrat. I am neither black nor white. I'm a child of the king. That's first. Come on, y'all. Very, very important that we not miss that, that we are kingdom subjects first and foremost. What most believers lose sight of is the truth that Satan has established a rebellion against the kingdom of God. And I need you to hear me say now that he has set out on rampage to prevent God's kingdom from being established in the earth realm. If you would go back with me to the Garden of Eden, you will understand with me that back in Eden, when God initially created the earth, there were only two subjects on the face of the earth, namely um, Adam and Eve. And what you need not miss in that initial design, God's kingdom was functioning well. Come on, say amen. There were no problems, there were no issues, there were, sin was not rampant in the world, and the kingdom of God, as far as God is concerned and as far as the earth is concerned, was operating the way God intended it to be. Now, understand with me that Satan was already thrown out of heaven because of his rebellious mindset. So here's what happens now. He enters God's perfect realm, and his goal is to disrupt what God wants done in the earth realm, so he starts a rebellion. Come on, does that make sense? And and what he's doing is really he's trying to establish his kingdom within a kingdom, if that makes any sense. So what does he do? He goes out, he calls Adam and Eve to sin, and he gets them to fail, and he begins the process now of establishing his kingdom in the earth realm. Now, the problem is, the problem, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to, to, to Cain and Abel, I mean, Adam and Eve in a little while. The problem is, because time has lapsed on, Satan's kingdom in the earth has gained a lot of momentum. Come on, y'all. It's been going on for a long time. Matter of fact, it seems now, Scripture says it this way, that our default state, when we enter the earth, we're not by default born into the kingdom of God. We are default born into the sin world in which we live. David puts it this way in Psalm 51, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. So when I look around, by default, I don't naturally see the kingdom of God happening in the earth realm. The first thing I see is what the enemy is doing. Come on, I think you see the same thing as well. The first thing we see is the enemy's kingdom taking residence and taking rulership and taking reign in the earth realm. And matter of fact, he has gained so much momentum that as it relates to the earth now, Satan and his kingdom is in the majority while the kingdom of God or the people of God are in a minority. Oh, come on. And and the mistake, the mistake we are making, the mistake the church is making, is that we have relinquished dominance in the earth to the enemy because there's more of them than there is us. And here's the mistake we make. We have given the world over to him, and we act as if this domain belongs to the enemy. Come on now. And so what it looks like, what it looks like, cultural norm looks sinful, Cultural norm looks against God. Cultural norm, all these things that are unbiblical are acceptable, and we allow it to happen when I want you to hear me say that is not biblical norm. The Bible still says the earth is the Lord's. (laughs) Y'all know it. Amen. The world and they that dwell therein, right? And, and so, so why then, why then, why then, if the earth really is the Lord's and the fullness of it, the world and they that dwell therein, why then, if it truly belongs to God, have we relinquished it to the enemy? <laughs> why then have we allowed his kingdom to continue to grow and his kingdom continue to set up residence and precedence in the earth? And why is it now that, that we forget the fact that the earth belongs to God, yet and still we go to work and we allow the enemy to tell us what we ought to say and not... I wish I had somebody in here. Why, why is it? Why is it? Why is it? 
I want to say because as time has lapsed on, we have simply forgotten who we are. And we've forgotten that God is on a, he's on a mission to, to, to rebel against the rebellion. Let me tell you what I mean by that. He is on a mission to take back from the enemy everything that the enemy has stolen from him. You don't believe me? Let's go back to the Old Testament. Understand with me that when Adam and Eve failed and when they fail, God set out to reclaim and redeem them back into relationship with him. And the only way he was determined to do that was he was going to give himself in the form of his son to redeem man back to himself. Now notice the Old Testament pattern. What does God do? He chooses a nation of people to begin the establishment of his kingdom in the earth realm. He chooses Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. Then he calls them the people of Israel and lock into this. His design for the people of Israel was to live within his kingdom in the the broader scheme of the enemy's domain. And here's what would happen. Here's what would happen. His design was that these people who were in the kingdom of God would live life such that they would infiltrate the world and infiltrate the enemy's kingdom, eventually reclaiming for God everything that belongs to him. But what would happen, just like you and just like me today, that the the enemy had so much of a gain and so much momentum and his kingdom was so impactful that as opposed to God's people influencing them, they in turn influenced the people of God. Now, don't act like that doesn't happen today. Come on, y'all. Don't act like that doesn't happen today. That was the Old Testament. And then so what, is, what, what happens? God continues to press and he continues to, to, to move. And, and it's no different than what he's trying to get the church to do today. The reason the church exists, the church does not exist, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but the church does not exist for the mere per- pleasure of just being this community that lives in isolation. We have have a job, we have a challenge, we have an obligation, we have a calling, we have a mission, we have battles to fight. And our goal is to go out into the world and reclaim what the enemy has rightfully taken. But my concern, because the enemy has gained so much momentum that the task seems impossible, and as a result, the people of God do several things. Number one, We go into hiding. (laughs) Come on now. Secret society. Or we fight wrong. Come on. I want y'all to hear me, right? And and or and and we don't end up engaging. But I want you to hear me say this morning, and we're gonna spend the remainder of our time here. Our job as believers in Christ, I'm going to use an interesting word, is to undermine or subvert the enemy's kingdom to reclaim everything that the devil has stolen to bring it back into the kingdom of God because my Bible still says the earth belongs to God and the fullness of it, the world and everything that dwell therein. So as a reminder, as a reminder of whose we are and who we are, I want us to walk through this text that's in front of us, and I want us to see what God is saying here, because I want us to look at a passage of Scripture, and I want you to hang your hat on this thought as we talk through this, that God is calling his church to reestablish his kingdom on earth by engaging all who have rebelled against him with the love of Christ. I want y'all to hear that carefully, okay? We have a charge, we have an obligation, we have a commitment, we have work to do, and God is calling us to go out and be about the Father's business. So here's what we are going to do for the next few weeks. We're going to rebel against the rebellion. (laughs) Yeah, here's what that means. Where the enemy may try to get me to do what he's got everybody else doing, I'm going to rebel against him because I don't belong to him. I belong to God. Yeah, come on. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm going to learn how to rebel against the rebellion. Yeah, tell the other, say, other neighbor, I don't know about you, but I'm going to learn how to rebel against the rebellion. Yeah, we're going to go to that. So go with me in your Bible 
And I'm going to be quick this morning. I just want to lay some foundations, share four simple truths with you as we walk through this. Then we're going to spend some time fleshing out. In Luke chapter 4, we have Jesus now has come on the scene. And let me, let me, let me kind of abstract up as fast as I can. Jesus comes into the earth to, to paint a broader picture of what the church is and what the mission of God is in the earth realm. So what we have in Luke chapter 4 now is that Jesus had already grown up. He was born into the earth. He's grown up. And, and what the beginning of chapter 4 is, is follows after Jesus had gone into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy at the end of his 40 days of fasting and 40 days of prayer, he now says, I'm ready for battle. I want y'all to hear it this way. I'm ready for battle. I'm ready to engage the rebellion with what God has called me to do. So his first task now is to refocus the people of God, to refocus the Israelites, because as time has gone on, just like me and just like you, we've forgotten purpose. We've forgotten what we're all about. They become complacent, and they found themselves doing church as usual, having ministry as usual, and missing what God wants done. So the chapter picks up in Luke chapter 4. Jump with me at verse 16. And notice what it says here. Verse 16 says, say amen if you're there. I want us to read together. Amen. Amen. Okay. Notice how Jesus says, he came to Nazareth. This is after he had been fasting for 40 days where he had been brought up. And notice this, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given him, and un he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Now, let me pause there a moment because there's four things I want to share. And the first thing I want you to take away from this, and let me speak to you just like I had to speak to myself this morning. Number one, to rebel against the rebellion, we must have a clear understanding of our identity in relation to the world. Okay? Now, let me explain what I mean by that. I am not a child of a king just for the mere pleasure of being a child of the king. My identity is not in Christ just for the mere pleasure of me reaping the benefit of having an identity in Christ. There is work for me to do. And I want to say the same thing to you, and I want to say the same thing to the church of God. There is work for all of us to do. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there is work for us to do. Look at the text, and let's see if we can see ourselves in the first two verses. It says here, and he, being Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And it says, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, let me pause for a little while, and, and, and you need to hear this. Jesus was no stranger to how church was done um, in the biblical times, nor was he a stranger to how ministry was conducted. And what the author is trying to communicate, this is not the first time that Jesus is showing up in the synagogue to disrupt things. It was customary that every Sunday, Mary and Joseph took him to church. Matter of fact, he grew up in the church. If you remember anything about what the New Testament says, you will remember since the age of 12 or before the age of 12, he would continually go to the custom, but we have the first recorded instance when he was 12 years old, he was engaged with the scribes and the Pharisees. Come on, y'all remember that. Come, y'all remember that. So, so they recognized early in his life that they had a gifting about himself. They recognized early in his life that he was no ordinary child, that he was no ordinary boy, that God had a unique calling on his life. And the reason I want to point that out is because you ought to hear me say just like Jesus, because of this dispensation of grace, you are no ordinary person. Amen. Oh, come on now. You, you, you're no ordinary child. You're no ordinary nothing. And God has a unique calling for you. He has a unique mandate for us to do. So look at the text. He goes, and it says here, they, it was his turn to teach. Obviously, he was in the rotation. And it says the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. And I wish I had a scroll to show you how difficult it was for him to go through what he went through to find the book of Isaiah, where here we've got names of books, and we've got verses, and we've got chapters. They didn't have all that in the scroll. So that says he had to know the word. Oh, I wish I had. I wish I had. He had to know what he was doing. He had 
he was going. So, so, so now here, here once again, we, we must understand our identity in relation to the world. Now, the reason I want to point that out is because we moved, before we move to the next step, there was a place where Jesus had consecrated himself, where he was confident in his identity. Remember with me, just prior to this, he was in the wilderness being tested for 40 days and 40 nights. And remember with me, listen to the enemy's question. If you are the what? Son of God. And, and the enemy was challenging his identity. And because Jesus was confident in who he is, he was prepared now to engage the world. So here's a word of caution. If you don't know who you are, be careful. <laughs> If you don't know who you are, be careful, all right? And we spent a lot of time on the issue of identity before we got here. So my prayer is that we all knew, ho, know who we are. Maybe all we need is a little bit of unplugging the fast and pray to get fueled up so we can engage. Uh, anybody ready to do battle this morning? Come on, anybody ready to do battle this morning? Come on, say amen if you're ready to do battle. Now, look at this. Look at this. So now that we know who we are, look at, look at the second thing I want to kind of point out in, in the text, if I can get this to go. So watch this. So if we're going to rebel against the rebellion, we must have a clear understanding of God's mission in the world. Okay? We must know what God is about so we can work with God. Hence, all that data I gave you on the, gave you on the introduction. So notice this. Jesus says here in verse 18, the spirit of the Lord, as he reads Isaiah, is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to, to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And I love this last part, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, I need to point some things out because it's very, very important that we understand what's happening here. Now, you guys have heard me say this a million times. I think it's very appropriate that I say it right now. Jesus didn't go to Calvary. Die on that cruel cross so that you and I can come here every Sunday and have a good worship experience. Let that settle in for a little while. Some of y'all, I love church. <laughs> That's good. But you don't go to the gym and work out in the gym just for the sake of working out in the gym. At some point, you have to leave the gym and get in the game. Let me help you what's happening here. Up until this time, here's what they were doing. Every Sabbath, get up, get dressed. Well, shut everything down first. Get up. Get dressed, go to church, worship God, go home, get undressed, and went about their regular life. Secret society. Next Sabbath come, they'd get up, get dressed, come to church, do the normal, go home, get undressed, and go about their secret life. Okay? And watch what was not happening. Nobody was getting saved. Nobody was getting healed. Nobody was being brought into the kingdom of God. And listen to this now. And you wonder why the enemy's kingdom is so large. Because all they were doing is getting up, get dressed, go to church. When the music got good and it felt good, huck and buck every now and then, you know, shiver. Um, come on, y'all. Yeah, 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 you know, a little something, something. <laughs> and then they'd go home and say, girl, wasn't that good? Let's go pop a doze. And <laughs> right? And, and it was the routine, and it was the routine, and it was the routine. And they'd go to work on Monday, and they wouldn't tell nobody about Jesus. They'd go to work on Tuesday. Am, am I sounding like us now? Come on, yeah. And then they'd come back, and then here's what would happen. And every time they do that, the enemy would go, I'm going to take you in my kingdom. I'm going to take you in my kingdom. And the sad commentary is sometimes he was coming into the very kingdom of God and plucking folk out and putting them in his Right? I want you all to get the picture. Come on, come on, come on. And you wonder now that time has progressed. Why he has gained so much momentum is because the people who are designed to rebel against the rebellion are not rebelling. We're not fighting. So Jesus shows up on the scene. 
And he had to switch some things. He had to change some things. He had to turn the momentum. So he comes and he says, I've been anointed by the Spirit. Watch this now. Because he has sent me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight of the blind, and to set at liberty the oppressed. Now, the sad commentary about this verse is that this is probably not the first time these people had heard this verse preached because it was in the Torah and they would read it from time and time again. And they thought this was prophecy that would be fulfilled later on by someone else. It was not their responsibility to do that. And so Jesus comes on the scene. And let me, let me back up. Anybody in here been filled by the Spirit? Come on, y'all. Talk to me. Come on, come on. And, and, and the reason I'm pointing that out, because if we know whose we are and who we are, we recognize that there's a mandate for us to do. Right? So he understood fully well what God's mission was. And when it was his turn to preach at the right time, when he turned about 30 years of old, here's what he says. It's time to shake stuff up because the enemy's kingdom is advancing and the rebellion is getting larger and larger and larger. And the church is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the enemy is taking God's people and putting them into his kingdom. And God is not going to have it. So if we know what God's mission is, his mission is to bring people into relationship with him. I'm moving past because I just want to lay some foundation. So number two, we need to know what the mission of God is in the, in the world, right? And so now watch this thing. And then the third thing I want you to hear this is if we're going to rebel against the rebellion, we must have a clear understanding that God's kingdom is here and I love that. In the what? This is going to mess you up because I want to spend a long time here, not today. Here is my theology. In the sweet by and by, we shall be on that beautiful store, shore. And we say, when I get to heaven, it's going to be all good. No more heartache, no more pain. No more sickness. Come on, y'all. When I get to heaven, I'm going to get on the streets of gold. Uh, and, and everything about the way we live life right now is hope of getting to heaven and nothing to do with now in the here and now. And we think, we think. And, and, and we're partially true because we're going to talk about this in the upcoming weeks, right? Jesus, Jesus now said, because remember with me, their problem, their problem with accepting Jesus and seeing who he is is they were waiting for a Messiah to come to overthrow the Roman government, thinking that they're going to be in, in control and dominance. And here Jesus was in their midst saying, I'm here, and they're missing it. He's in their midst. I mean, come on, he's preaching. He's the one teaching the word, right? And, and they're missing it. They're missing it, right? And here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying to them. Hey, y'all waiting for this to happen? It's here. And, and I want the church to hear me say this. Y'all waiting to go to heaven, and God wants me to say to you, it's here. Oh, gosh. You're not ready for that. You're not ready for that. I want us to flesh this out. I want, you to, I want us to walk this out real quick, right? Because here's, here's what Jesus said. Look at this, and we're going to talk about it. So he gets now in verse 20, and he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, watch this, today this scripture, and in the perfect tense, has been fulfilled in your Hearing. So listen to what listen to what Jesus is saying. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Hey, listen, I know what the prophecy says, but listen, you're looking at the fulfillment of prophecy. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And 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 what the perfect tense says, this is very, very important. It happened in the past, right? And and it didn't end when Jesus went back to heaven. It keeps on happening, and 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 it's a continual happening. Because here's the good news about that. When Jesus was on the face of the earth, when he left, here's what he says: I'm gonna send the Father, he's gonna send a comforter who's gonna be with you, and he's all also going to be in you. And the reason he's going to be there, because the things you see me do, greater than these, shall you do. Nobody said to Jesus when he was on earth, hey Jesus, when you get to heaven, man, you're going to be awesome. Here's what he says, heaven is now. 
What do you mean, Jesus? The kingdom is here. Oh, y'all, no, y'all don't want, you know, what do you mean the kingdom is here, Jesus? Look at this. The hungry is being fed. The lame is being able to walk. Blinded eyes are being opened up. What more do you want to go? You want to wait for the blind person to get to heaven to see? I can make him see now. Y'all missing this. You're missing this. So it's here. It's here. It's here. And here's what they're saying. Dang, word, Jesus, word. Just like some of y'all sitting here saying, word, pass the word. And then you can go home and get undressed and go to work and don't do nothing about it. Tell folk at work, you need to come to heaven with me. And they're like, I need heaven now. I can't wait to get there. Somebody was just telling us about all the crazy stuff that's going on in the political realm about how people are coming out and people are saying they were wounded and all this stuff. And, and if the church does not have the proper response to tell them heaven can be now, we got to understand what that means. We have to understand what that means. Right? And here's what that means. God has come to provide a solution to all the cares, the problems, the concerns, and to place us in a domain where the enemy don't have access to us. And Jesus says the kingdom is now. And man, they missed it, they missed it, they missed it. They missed it, they missed it. I'm going to come back to this next week because this is some good stuff. And they missed it and they missed it and they missed it. So here's what happened. The enemy keeps coming and he keeps plucking them out of the church and putting them in his kingdom. And the church is living in secret society. Oh, pray for us, y'all. The enemy's on our back. We don't know who we are. Because if we know who we are, he, come on, y'all. It should be the other way around. We should be going into the enemy's kingdom. I'm not calling you a demon, bro. And take, take folk and, and then grab them out of the enemy kingdom and bring them into, come on, y'all. And then here's what we say on Sunday morning. Got another one. Who's going with me? And then we go out there and we grab another one from the king. And got another one. Who's going with me? And we go up and imagine if every person in here engaged him in work. I think you talked about multiplication, right? And every week we grab another one. Guess what will happen? God's kingdom will do this, and the enemy's kingdom going to do what? Woo! But we have a Pharisaic mindset. Nobody here is church across the way. And we're waiting to get to heaven. And God left us here to grow heaven. So when he comes back, heaven is already full. Did y'all get that? He wants heaven filled up on earth. So when he comes, he's taking a full heaven. And we forget why we're left. We forget why we were plucked out. We forget why we're here. Here's the problem. Last thing and I'm done. We can pick this up next week. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. To win the fight... We must have a clear understanding that the focus of God's kingdom, watch this, infiltrating the enemy's domain, not simply blessing those who are already <laughs> members of the kingdom. <laughs> if you're a prosperity person, this one will mess you up. Because you got saved so you can be the head and not the tail above and not beyond the front and not the back. <laughs> me, 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 me. And it's all about me, 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 me. Let me read a lot. Then I'll sum it up and talk. Look at verse 20. And he spoke well and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't that just Derek? All of a sudden, he coming to work telling us about Jesus now. <laughs> Isn't that Shaniqua? <laughs> Didn't I see her on Colfax last week? Now she coming talking about Jesus up in here. I, girl, please, didn't you buy something from her? You know, <laughs> y'all leave that alone. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, leave that alone. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. And they said, 
is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, physician, heal yourself. In other words, prove to us who you are. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your own hometown as well. Let me back up. So here's what happens. For he got that he was in Capernaum, healing the sick, doing the miraculous, doing all that stuff. Then he comes to church, and they say, show us a magic trick in church. Right? Because we heard. You're out in Capernaum, and you're healing the sick, feeding the 5,000. You're doing all that stuff. And they come to church and say, okay, if you're all that, do it here. Let me get ahead of myself. Y'all going to get it. I didn't come for the well, but for the sick. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Magic won't work on you because you're already healed. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys getting this? You kind of get what I'm saying? I am empowered not to work in here. I wish I had somebody. But, but to do what? Work where? Here. And the problem with the church is we think the spirit is only designed to work in here. So here's what it looks like. Thank you. Girl, he filled with the spirit. Girl. Nothing wrong with a good shout. Nothing wrong with a good shout. But don't confuse the anointing with emotion. Right? Anointing does this. Be healed. In the name of Jesus, get up. Give your life to Christ. That's what anoint. Oh, y'all don't want this. It, is this making sense? Okay? So here's what they said. And I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And they said, physician, heal yourself. Verse 24, he said to them, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own town. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up. Three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah. And none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. The Syrian. And when they heard these things, and all, it says, all in the synagogue, they got ticked off. And watch this. And then they rose up and drove him out of their town. Y'all don't throw me out, please. <laughs> and, and the town was built um, on a hill on which it was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. And passing by to their midst, he went away. This is funny. This is funny to me. This is funny to me. Let me tell you why this is funny. Here's what they said. Jesus, do something for us. Show us a miracle. And he says, no, it's not about you. It's about going to the enemy's kingdom and reclaiming. He has sent me, apostolos is the Greek word, sent to reclaim liberty. He sent me to the Aurora Mall. He sent me to Highlands Ranch. He sent me to Talon's Reach. He's, you kind of get where I'm going? He, he sent me to Green Valley. He sent me to downtown Denver. He sent me to all the neighborhoods and all the buildings and all the workplaces that we work. Those places where people live, learn, work, and play so I can be the presence of God them to reclaim people who have rebelled against God to bring them into relationships. So when we come here, we come here to celebrate the growth of the kingdom of God and what God is doing. Are we? Not, not, when we come here, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's not not about us. It's about us being equipped to go back out and bring folk back into. The, so here's what they say: Show us something. And he says, "Y'all ain't getting nothing." And then they got mad with him, and they tried to stone him. They took him right to the edge of a cliff. You, this is this is deep to me. It's like they. It's almost like they picked him up. Just go here for me, my, your imagination. They picked him up, and they took him to the edge of the cliff, and then they put him on the edge of the cliff, and they're about to throw him off. And he worked a miracle, and they didn't even see it. All oh, y'all blind. Bam. Then he turned around and just walked right through them. <laughs> the, the, watch these fools. <laughs> Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? He needs to show us a miracle. They missed what was happening. I wish I had somebody. <laughs> in, in, in very they, they, 
right in their midst. They missed it. And, and, and that's the problem with you. And that's the problem with me. God is doing miraculous in our very midst. But, but so we're so caught up on ourselves. We miss what he's doing. We miss how he's moving. We miss what he wants done. Because it's all about me, myself, and I. And it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him empowering us. That's why we can't see nothing because we have eyes and we can't see. Focus on the wrong place. So here's what he said, and I'm done. Come on, Pastor Kay. The harvest is what? Yeah. And the laborers are what? Because they have been good church. <laughs> and missing it. Kingdom? I'm messed up right now. Every time I start these series, I get messed up. Because <laughs> that means I got to go in my neighborhood now and snatch some people out. You kind of get, yeah, you get what I'm saying? I think you got the same problem too. You can't go to work tomorrow the same way. Amen. Can't go home the same way. Amen. You got to snatch some people out. Yes. And we miss it. We miss it. We miss it. We miss it. So solemn word, this is me. I hear God saying to Felix, Felix, man, you need to repent, dude, because you were planning great church services. Nothing wrong with that. Those are important. Those are critical. But you can't afford to allow the enemy's kingdom to grow and the rebellion to gain momentum while the church keeps diminishing. The Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to one. A friend of ours, Ted Haggard, said to our team, met with him, he said, Restoration Christian Fellowship ought to make it hard for anyone to go to hell from Denver. <laughs> right? Man, we got work to do. Bow your heads with me. Lord, do what only you could do, Lord. <sighs> Speak. If there's one here that don't know you, maybe don't have a revelation of your love, reveal yourself, God. Show yourself to them. Continue to show yourself to me. We want to be about your business, God. If you can take two fish and five loaves and feed 5,000, imagine what your word could do, Lord, as it goes out. So draw, draw, draw. Draw, draw, draw. We love you, God. We love you. If there's one here that want to know more about your kingdom and how they can experience kingdom now, bring them, Lord. And as we talk about this more, open our hearts. Open our hearts, God. We want to reestablish the kingdom of God in the earth, the present aspect of the kingdom, so we can live life differently now. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you're doing. You're an awesome God. Give this to you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Give God some praise this morning.